and welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Rachel Breitster and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluations at the close of today's webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you complete our short post-test and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best meet your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. You can call us at any time at 1-800-452-0662 or send us an email at phlive.ny at gmail.com. Now we do review the feedback and evaluations from each program and so it's come to my attention that viewers have expressed an interest in hearing more of the questions from our audience. So with that in mind, I'd like to strongly encourage you to submit questions to us throughout the program, whether by phone or email. You don't have to wait till the end of the show, and in fact, I would encourage you not to, to ensure that we get your message before the show is closing out. We do look forward to hearing from you and hope to have lots of questions to answer today. Today's program is setting ourselves up for success. Extreme weather, climate, and health. Our speaker is Dr. Nathan Graber, the director of the Center for Environmental Health at the New York State Department of Health. Nathan, thank you so much for being here today. We're really excited for the show. Thank you for having me. I think this is a great way to start out as, uh, uh, in my new position to be speaking about this topic. Excellent. So yeah. certainly when we picked this topic several months ago, it was relevant, it was important. But now as we're sitting here in the midst of this heat wave, I'm thinking to myself, I can hardly imagine a better time to be having a conversation about extreme weather and public health. So why don't we just start kind of talking about where we are right now and what's actually going on? Well, I think this is, you're right, this is, a, is, a, is an extremely relevant time to be speaking about climate and its impacts on health and also what we should be doing about it. Now, if I, if I think back to when I first got involved in uh, climate and how it relates to health, one of the first things, you know, that it seemed that we had to tackle was um, the understanding that first that the climate is, is changing uh, and, and uh, another thing that we sort of had to, um, uh, another uh, a big hurdle we had to overcome is how is that associated with health? So like for instance, when we first spoke about heat waves, uh, in general, were public health professionals thinking about how heat waves were impacting on, on health? Uh, and I think we passed that hurdle. And I think we passed the hurdle where we have an understanding that the climate is in fact changing. I'm gonna talk about that today. And if you look at the local, you know, most recent news, I mean, you know, we started out this year with, you know, sort of remote uh, news showing us that um, there were extreme heat waves, drought and wildfires in the Southwest. Well, now we're experiencing it here in the Northeast and here in New York State. In addition, we had uh, severe flooding in central New York this year. So certainly a lot of very relevant weather events that are happening right here, not out there in the, the other world, but directly impacting us. Mm -hmm. Now, as we're having this conversation, there are some key ideas that I think to just lay the foundation of what do we mean by weather, what do we mean by climate. So what are some of the terminology that you think people need to know to have these kinds of discussions? Right. I think it's important that we all understand this different terminology because it's relevant in how each of these different um, uh, uh, exposures, such as weather, uh, extreme weather events, climate, climate variability, uh, trends and projections, how that all will relate to those health outcomes. Mm -hmm. But we also should understand the risk factors, both the risk factors for individuals as well as risk factors for communities as a whole, as well as risk factors for, in, uh, for infrastructure. And then, and then hopefully, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about and get some good um, information today on our interventions, which um, could take the form of adaptation, which could take the form of mitigation, which all will hopefully lead towards this concept of resilience, which I hope to convey today. Excellent. So let's start by just looking at some of those more basic terminology and start, mm -hmm. tell us about weather. What do we mean when we say the word weather? Okay, so, so when we talk about weather, we're talking about the current state of, of atmospheric conditions. So that's like temperature, humidity, wind speed, the amount of sun uh, exposure, and, and so on. So that's what's happening sort of right now. And associated with that, we sometimes hear about extreme weather events. Now, extreme weather events, that's something that's occurring outside of the ordinary. But what's important about it, the important concept, I think, for public health is understanding that um, uh, the way National Weather Service has definitions for those extreme weather events, and they put together with those um, th uh, thresholds and triggers for releasing advisories and alerts uh, and warnings and watches, and, and those are then used to then trigger responses, both from emergency response and preparedness. So, so extreme weather events and, and understanding um, how those are defined and triggered is important also in terms of uh, planning for public health responses. Sure. Now mm -hmm. one of the other terms you were going to address is climate. And sometimes people use yeah. weather and climate interchangeably, but in fact they are two separate 
ideas. That's right. And it's really important to understand that because, you know, weather is what's happening right now. That's what we're being exposed to. Climate is sort of a, an average of the weather over time. And that can be over decades. That can be over years. Uh, and, and when we take a look, like we have this map up here right now, which is showing um, uh, what we're looking at in the last, you know, few months here in New York State, is that certain parts of New York State have experienced above normal precipitation. And what that means is that the, there's more rain than what would be expected for this particular time of year in those particular geographic locations. And along with that is this concept of climate variability. So just because it's it, you know uh, outside of what's expected uh, doesn't mean that we, we've demonstrated necessarily a trend in this case, but what we're seeing is, is that something called climate variability. In other words, climate's the average. And the variability is um, uh, uh, how that, you know, will those sort of range of the different um, extremes of that, uh, of the weather during that time. And now when we look at weather over time, looking at mm -hmm. New York State over the last century, what, have the, what are the trends that we've seen? So, so if we take a look at the um, uh, climate over, let's say, the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. So we have these maps up here on, on the next slide that we're going to see. And, and if we take a look at these, you're going to see that, you know, certain, first of all, it's not uniform across the state. So you, you see the different colors represent different um, variations where the extreme on the left, we're looking at the, the, the heat waves and uh, extreme heat. And so you'll see that for some parts of the state, there's been a big you know, uh, change. There's been a larger change, I'm sorry, towards a much hotter climate. And, you know, some small pockets in sort of local areas, you know, have also shown a trend. Some of them have stayed basically, you know, about the same, but other areas have gotten, in some small areas, have gotten a little bit cooler, you know, over the last, you know, 100 years. And we see the same kind of variation, geographic variation for, uh, for precipitation. So, so the important points here is, yes, uh, we've demonstrated over the last 100 years that the, the climate is changing. We're seeing more rainfall. We're seeing more uh, heat overall. And, and yes, there is vari variation based on um, geographic location. Now, when we look at the last couple of years and then mm -hmm. looking to the future, what sort of mm -hmm. trends have we seen and what can we project is going to happen? Well, I think it's important how we look at projections, right? Because those are, you know, th those there's a lot of uncertainty in, you know, what's going to happen in sure. the future. I mean, that's just the way things are. So, so when we take a look at this, you know, we we first of all we have the historical um, uh, data that shows that things have changed, mm -hmm. that we're now seeing more extreme weather events, that now the temperature is hotter, and 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 now and 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 now we're seeing the spread of vector-borne diseases and. As a, as a result of it, we're seeing things that are happening because of it. So going forward, you know, there there are projections that say, well, we may continue in the same path. What we don't see in these projections, um, it doesn't take into account, is what's going to happen in terms of climate variability. Climate variability can have a, a very big impact on health as well in a different way. You know, so we have the sort of the extreme, you know, weather events that can have an impact on health. We have that climate variability, which is those shifts and changes, and we see that sort of over the the shoulder seasons, like in the spring, in the in the fall, uh, where where you know rapid changes in temperature can have a, a bigger impact on health than than um, even more extreme temperature during the middle of a season. Uh, and, and, um, and so, you know, we going, you know, going forward, when we take a look at these projections, there is, there is uncertainty, but we see that the general trend has been uh, towards uh, uh, a worsening of, of these weather conditions, and that's where we are right now. So, yeah. so in looking at, you know, we can identify what the trends have been, and we can do a projection of what's going to happen mm -hmm. in the future. How yeah. does that relate to health? I mean, when we tie it all together, what's going to be the impact on public health as a result of this change in climate? Well, you know, some of the some of the impacts. I think I think this is generally like public health professionals have become pretty familiar with this. Mm -hmm. I spoke about that, you know, already. That sure. we know that things are happening, and and we see that the local health departments are, are, are dealing with this as well as as um, as the state and so on. But you know, so some of some of them are direct impacts. So we think about heat heat you know extreme heat events, right? So you're going to have um, uh, people who are. Uh, 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 who are affected and they and they have um, heat some type of form of heat illness like heat stroke or hyperthermia, and and then you may see you know a sort of a, a, um, a an impact on um, individuals who can't you know um, adjust as well you know so so for instance um, uh, people with underlying uh, cardiovascular disease or with pulmonary disease and and that shows up as sort of excess mortality so more people dying than what's been expected uh, because of the increasing temperature and and so you know we see sort of the direct impacts of extreme weather events we see with floods and we've seen a lot of floods Irene Lee uh, Sandy recently 
And, um, and with each of those, you see the immediate effects. You know, people direct injuries, people drowning, electrocution, things happening during the event itself from, fall, uh, from the exact event itself, sure. things secondary to that event. Uh, so uh, health effects from, you know, uh, displacement, mm -hmm. sheltering in place, uh, uh, sheltering, uh, moving to a shelter, uh, and those can be uh, impacts like um, uh, discontinuation of chronic management of chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, those could be mental um, uh, impacts on mental health uh, and mental illness. Um, uh, we have to um, always, you know, uh, think about. Um, uh, other impacts, such as in sheltering in place, the types of injuries that can occur from living in, an in a home that's been damaged, uh, sure. such as carbon monoxide poisoning or just overall indoor air quality uh, impacts from uh, restoration and recovery work. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of things that we have to consider that, you know, there's some of these, some of these relationships are very straightforward mm -hmm. uh, and they're very direct, but some of them are more complex. Like, so we think of some of the most complex ones are um, the interaction between a change in environment impact on sort of agriculture and sure. food supply and yield and impact on socioeconomic factors that then can impact on health. So, so we have sort of the direct, we have those secondary impacts, and then we have these more distant sort of tertiary impacts. And, you know, in New York State, we think about it, right? So we have increasing temperature, increased frequency of extreme weather events, uh, worsening air quality uh, related, which is sort of secondary to a lot of these extreme uh, temperature events. Um, alter altered sort of water quality or quantity is a concern of ours. You know, that's another impact. And then ecosystem changes. And one of the ecosystem changes is like, we think about it, if the, if the temperature is changing, if we're becoming more like, like, uh, like Georgia, the New York State, mm -hmm. then what's gonna happen with some of the vectors that that carry disease in New sure. York State, and and so, um, so that's another uh, uh, thing that we have to consider is that there's going to be a shift in sort of vector-borne diseases. So it's a pretty big scope right there. I mean, there's the things that we immediately think of the the aftermath of what happens right there. But I mean, really, this this kind of goes on, the reaches of climate change and extreme weather events really ties into so many different aspects of our lives. That's right. So one of the things that Nathan mentioned was the changes in water, air, and vector-borne diseases. We met with Brian Backinson from the New York State Department of Health to talk about some of those changes and what we're he seeing here in New York State. Let's take a look at what he had to say. My name is Brian Backinson. Uh, I'm here in the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control at the State Health Department. Uh, we investigate outbreaks of disease. We also do a number of things with uh, vector-borne diseases as well, things carried by bugs like Lyme disease, West Nile virus, and so forth. So when people tend to think about climate, oftentimes they tend to think about big storms like Irene or, or Sandy or whatnot. And, and sometimes it's the more kind of insidious aspects of, of changes in climate that can have real impacts in, in disease as well. Diseases carried by ticks or diseases carried by mosquitoes, for example, can really increase their range um, with just a, a one degree, a half a degree, uh, either for the mosquitoes, for the ticks themselves, uh, or even for the vectors, the, thing that the host, the things that they feed on. Um, Lyme disease we've seen uh, move from being a disease that was basically just in Long Island and north of New York City to now as far north and as far west as, as Syracuse and Binghamton. A disease like vibriosis is one that's associated with shellfish consumption. And a lot of the shellfish that we consume is from shellfish beds in Long Island Sound. Uh, Long Island Sound is relatively shallow and the shellfish beds themselves are very sensitive to changes in temperature. And right now as we're taping this in uh, the beginning of July, there's one shellfish bed in Oyster Bay that has been closed and it's unclear how long that's going to stay closed and a lot of this is because of the increase in water temperatures. You know, if we wind up having these water temperature increases be consistent, we may have these shellfish beds that close for, you know, a short period of time, a long period of time, and that has impacts on both public health and the economy. So surveillance is something that we do to basically monitor for diseases across the state. We do it year round. And we're basically always doing it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That kind of gets ramped up at times after we've had certain large events, again, like a Hurricane Sandy or a, a Hurricane Irene, where basically what we're gonna do now is we're gonna focus on a specific geographic area. We're gonna look to see if there's increases in you know, diseases that might be associated with the storm. So one of the things that we do with regards to surveillance, it's like a big circle. What we learn from seeing ill individuals sometimes leads us to go back and look at other aspects of the disease. With uh, arthropod-borne or bug-borne diseases, for example, 
we saw an increase in, in cases of babesiosis, uh, tick-borne illness, in areas where we'd never seen them before. We then went out and got our people in the field to go collect ticks from those particular areas. They collected those ticks, they tested those ticks, they found not, babesi not just babesiosis, but they found another pathogen as well. We then turned that back around and then started to look and try and find more cases of the disease that was caused by that pathogen, one called anaplasmosis, in this area as well. We found those cases. They then lead to increases in education. So we can then reach out and basically tell uh, the public, uh, providers, uh, the press, that these are diseases to be on the lookout for. We know now that they're in this particular geographic area. And to tell people what they can do to either diagnose or prevent the diseases from getting them in the first place. The role of climate and health is, is one that's very intertwined. It's one that people don't necessarily think about all the time. They think about the big storms that impact them, but there's a lot of little things in there as well that uh, can potentially lead to impacts in health. So again, one of the things that I find really interesting is, you know, we see these weather events and we think of the direct impact, but looking at how far reaching the effects of climate change are, I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, as we consider the impact on different populations, and I think you referenced this earlier, but are some people more vulnerable to these impacts than others? That's right, and I think you know we should think, be thinking about that in a lot of different ways because there are multiple factors, and and um, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. So you have sort of the physical environment. So what is what is the um, are, are people living in a floodplain, and are they at risk for or along a coastal flood zone? Are they at risk for flooding? Uh, then we have the physical sort of structures that they live in. Are those resistant to the impacts of extreme weather events, or are they re, you know adaptable to sort of the more you know. Uh, 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 in, you know, the more, um, uh, uh, the sort of the trends and changes in, let's say, temperature, you know, could, um, uh, do the home stay cool? So it's sort of the physical structure, can they resist those? Do they have the, uh, you know, uh, the right kind of structure to be, you know, a safe environment? So if we think about people who, you know, could be exposed to extreme heat, you know, do they live under a black tar roof in a brick building? You know, are they, uh, uh, do they have, you know, the physical, um, uh, do they have air conditioning? Mm -hmm. But also, let's think about this, you know, it's also community sort of adaptability and resilience. And, the, and that is, you know, does, does that, um, that adaptability kind of speaks to, are they resistant? to the, um, uh, uh, the impacts of these health outcomes, you know, when things happen, do they have ways to, um, uh, are there, is there already sort of prepared, uh, people using their air conditioners when heat waves come? And then there's, then there's the resiliency, which is also about, not just about that resistance, but also about um, how quickly they can recover. So do the sort of acts of, you know, the things that, that require sort of, uh, that are required for sort of daily living, are those things that they come back very quickly? Um, are the supermarkets reopened? Is transportation, you know, is it restored quickly? Uh, and, uh, and so on. And then, you know, sort of overlapping with that are some of the sort of, you know, individual sensitivities. And I just forgot to mention, you know, sort of like in the physical settings, there are other, you know, factors that sort of cross cut as well. Mm -hmm. And those are, are related to, you know, sort of the socioeconomic status and like environmental justice issues. Sure. So um, in terms of individual sensitivity, this is where we talk about individual risk factors. Can a person respond to, you know, extreme weather event, can they respond, you know, well to sort of just a changing trend in, in, uh, in those weather exposures or those temperature extremes? And, and so um, uh, in those respects, you know, we think about, you know, do people have the physiological ability? Is it, is it uh, hampered because of, let's say, normal aging sure. or because of underlying chronic disease? Or, or do they not have the ability to sort of control their own environment, either because of severe mental illness, substance use, or... Uh, 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 because um, uh, they don't make clear decisions about, you know, what's the right way to con sort of control their own sure. environment and reduce their exposures, and do they have a social support network that is helping them um, and is available to them to, to, to guide them through those decisions or to make the, you know, help them make those decisions in a, in a way that's going to be most protective of health. So in yeah. considering these different vulnerable populations, I understand you've spoken with some stakeholder organizations, and it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about what has their focus been on in terms of addressing climate change? 
Right. So, you know, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but we've done here at the State Health Department a number of surveys to understand um, how, uh, uh, to understand a number of different issues around, around mm -hmm. climate and health and how public health can respond to them. And so stakeholders have, a, you know, a particularly good, you know, in because they, they sort of broaden our reach, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But, you know, what's interesting from uh, the survey is that, uh, and I think this is important in terms of thinking about interventions, is that some of the stakeholders that were surveyed, uh, they're um, uh, mostly involved in mitigation activities. And mitigation, when we speak about that term, that's a reduction in the sort of causes of the climate change. So sort of like reductions in greenhouse gas emissions is one good example. So what are they doing to create or uh, reduce those uh, emissions? Um, and then the other groups, some other groups were involved in what we call adaptation. So we know the climate change. We know it's you know, strong potential for this to continue in the future. It's going to, you know, it's going to happen. And so, so let's accept that that's happening and it's happening right now. So, so we need to adapt to it. We need mm -hmm. to change our physical structures. We need to change our behaviors. We need to change activities and design interventions. And so a lot of the stakeholders were involved in that as well. And now you mentioned that the Department of Health has done certain assessments and um, about the I believe about the opinions or the roles of local health departments and things of that nature. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I and you know we're going to talk a little bit about those survey results, mm -hmm. um, but I just want to mention that you know it's sort of a broad survey that that you know we've surveyed a number of different groups, including leaders here at the Department of Health, mm -hmm. uh, uh, those um, uh, uh, people working on the activities that would be integral to a climate health response, and uh, local health departments, and as well as as well as stakeholders. So, what are some of the the things that you found? Did local health departments believe it was important to focus on climate health? So, I think this is really great news, right? Because <laughs> you know, over, overall, and this survey is a couple of years old already. Um, overall, we, what we found was that um, local health departments believe that it's really an important focus for the health department. Great. And did they feel like they had the resources available to address? these things that they felt were important. I think this is also great news because um, it shows that, you know, the fact that they um, disagreed that there are, you know, enough of the um, sort of information that they need in order to respond, like what are good interventions and, and do we have local surveillance data that's informative. So they, they realized that they need more information in order to proceed. So what were some of the key conclusions that you were able to draw from the assessments that were done? So, so here again, I'm going to reinforce what I said at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. There's been a paradigm shift. So now there's no question that there's an understanding that this climate and weather impacts on health. And because of that, um, uh, there's this conclusion, the local health departments, you know, they concluded that yes, it's important and it's a huge scale and scope, it's big. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think that that may be intimidating. Right, so I just want to you know comment on that, and just just really briefly is that, you know, these are things not unfamiliar to us. So when we talk about you know not just the fact that we're dealing with a lot of extreme weather events, but a lot of the activities that are necessary to require you know required or necessary to respond to climate and those public health impacts are things that we already do as as public health professionals. It's sure. not it's not something new, and I think they also you know they they cited sort of uh, a lack of direction, and I think that's something that. Uh, we can work together to provide, you know, what are the priority areas and what's the most important things to be working on. And, and then, you know, there's also this opportunity to partner and the importance of collaboration. And so I think that's really, you know, I think these are all very positive um, responses. Great. And I know you're going to talk more a little bit later about the different opportunities for collaboration as well. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to that. Now, I think many organizations probably struggle with a lack of resources or a lack of adequate information. And the Department of Health has recognized some of those concerns. We spoke with Eric Weigert about an innovative tool that was developed to help serve as a resource and improve efficiency for local health departments. We're going to take a moment now to hear from him about the process of developing that tool. Hi, I'm Eric Wiegert. I'm with the New York State Department of Health's Bureau of Community Environmental Health and Food Protection. I work in the regulatory program for swimming pools and bathing beaches. Harmful algal blooms are concentrations of algae or other organisms that can cause health, ecological, or even economic impacts. Blue-green algae is not even algae at all. It's a type of bacteria, cyanobacteria to be exact, and if conditions are right, it can, it can cause dense blooms. Some blue-green algae blooms can cause illness if they're contacted or ingested in significant amounts. The most commonly reported symptom from blue-green algae is rash, throat irritation, gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, or vomiting. Some types of blue-green algae can release toxins such as hepatotoxins which can impact the liver or neurotoxins which can impact the nervous system. 
Um, those type of symptoms are, are very rare, but they can occur and can be quite severe um, and cause illness in humans and in animals. And we've even had some, some dogs die as a result of their exposure to blue-green algae blooms that are releasing toxins. So one of the outcomes from the Center for Environmental Health's work group for harmful algal blooms was some guidance for responding to blue-green algae blooms at bathing beaches and also for non-regulated settings in water bodies. And what we developed was an, an interactive guidance tool which is responsive to the needs of local health departments and others that need to be able to respond. With the guidance and the tool being developed through this multidisciplinary approach, I, I really think it can serve as a template for responding to climate change issues in, in the future, serving as, a, as a, a model to provide the communication framework and all the interdisciplinary specialists that all work together to develop this tool and, and come forth with a product that uh, is usable at the local health department level where it's most important to be able to apply practices to protect public health. And I think another important aspect of the tool to emphasize is actually citizen level involvement that, that we've had and, and seen where we'll have reports of blue-green algae blooms coming in that people have snapped via their cell phones and sent them to the Department of Environmental Conservation or to their local health department and it's really helped us in, in diagnosing blooms and being able to respond in a timely manner. So I think it's really interesting and, and great actually to see, you know, health departments have said, you know, maybe we need a little bit more direction, more resources, and it's great to see some of the things that the Department of Health is developing and doing to be responsive to the mm -hmm. needs of health departments and other organizations. Now, in the surveys that you've done, who were some of the stakeholder groups that were surveyed? Well, you know, I, I think we have a, a slide and I just, you know, throw that up there, you know, because it's a really, it's a diverse, you know, wide ranging group of, um, of stakeholders who, who really represent, you know, New Yorkers in many different ways. Sure. And I think one of the great things about, you know, identifying stakeholders and maybe non-traditional public health partners is that, you know, many of the interventions for public health outcomes, um, for preventing the public health outcomes of climate and, and, and um, for climate change are, you know, not necessarily within, you know, the, you know, a within avenues that we can directly impact on, but through stakeholders and through these collaborations, we can certainly do that. And so the stakeholder organizations represent a fairly broad and, and diverse body of individuals. What did you learn from them about ideas that they had and barriers that they felt they were facing? Well, I think what's great about, you know, some of the ideas they had is that it shows and it demonstrates, you know, the shared interest, right? They, they see the need for increased outreach and education. They see the need for um, uh, improvements in policy development and media outreach and different ways for doing that. And, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, um, that provided us, you know, additional support for a lot of the work that uh, uh, we believe we should be doing going forward. Now, yeah. in terms of the work you're doing going forward and designing different interventions, can you talk to us about some of the different types of interventions? Because I know some of them are likely to have more of an impact or less of an impact. And can you talk about some of the different things that you might be doing? Right, so I think now many public health professionals are very familiar with the health impact pyramid. Mm -hmm. And I think we're using that, you know, as sort of a framework for um, how we design and think about different interventions. And I think we have to try to think about, uh, we should all be thinking about this in terms of our response to climate change. So, you know, at the very, very top of this pyramid are the interventions that we expect to have, you know, sort of the smallest impact. Mm -hmm. They're sort of, you know, these are things that require sometimes less, you know, um, uh, sort of political and financial capital to, sure. to implement, but um, uh, uh, and they may, you know, not have as big an impact. At the bottom of the pyramid are the uh, the areas of interventions that could have the largest impact. And so, so if we take a look here, um, it's not that we should be mutually exclusive and say not spend time at the top of the pyramid, because the truth of the matter is, is that outreach and education getting to this information to the right um, uh, stakeholders, getting them to the populations that are most at risk, getting them to understand, you know, those risks is extremely important. Sure. Now, when they have in the counseling and education actionable items, a lot of those are tied into interventions that fall lower on the pyramid okay. or, you know, where you have the bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So if we think about clinical interventions, you know, what's a good clinical intervention during an um, extreme weather event or during an emergency? It's having, you know, teams of outreach folks to go out and, um, uh, identify those at risk and check on them on a regular basis or having networks to do that and then longer lasting protective you know interventions you know maybe infrastructure you know more infrastructure change and no, I'm sorry not infrastructure changes but more like um, opening of cooling centers sure. or provision for free air conditioners and then you know changing the context this is where I think a lot of environmental health work lives right now anyway because a lot of the work that we do um, uh, and allows people to you know sort of live their 
their lives without having to think about the decisions that are going to impact on health. You don't think about whether you know your tap water is going to make you sick, or you're going to go to a restaurant and eat food, and you know you, have, you don't have to make decisions about those things because that's where environmental health, health you know workers have been uh, 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 sort of changing the context. Sure. You know, so those sort of general environmental issues, and a lot of the climate change work is going to be in this area where it's building that resilience. Um, uh, so, so that's you know we're going to focus, and then of course the the socioeconomic factors that uh, we want to impact on. So, so lots yeah. of different ways of, of conducting interventions with different resources available, different impacts. Now, how does this relate to some of the activities of local public health programs? Right. So, you know, I threw up on, you know, on a slide, like, all the activities that I could think of and sort of try to categorize them and rearrange them. And it all comes back to sort of the 10 essential uh, functions of local, you know, public health departments, right? So, so we look at the work that we do, and we have to see where can we, you know, um, integrate uh, uh, the climate work that we want to do. It's, remember, this is nothing new. I mean, these are, you know, we're doing surveillance activities, but we're doing surveillance activities for our health outcomes that are sure. directly related to these exposures uh, when it comes to uh, changes in the climate. Um, risk assessment, you know, outreach education, um, exposure hazard assessment, outbreak investigations, you know, it's, it's all part of um, our general response. And so there are, you know, interventions. We look at each one of these and say, you know, where, you know, where is the work that, this is the kind of work we already do. Mm -hmm. And are we taking into account uh, climate in, in everything that we do? And now how does this fit in with public health values? Mm -hmm. So, so I thought I'd just, you know, you know, just mention here, yeah. you know, we want to build resilience, right? So that's, you know, sort of successful adaptation. We want to do that. And in the process, you know, we just have to, you know, um, uh, just a, you know, quick reminder that, you know, we're, you know, we, we work for the, you know, the taxpayers. We have to sure. be a worthy steward of their, of their trust. How do we do that? Well, you know, once again, we have to focus on, on those health outcomes. We have to focus on outcomes and interventions. We have to build on what works. So if we know that something works, you know, we should um, uh, 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 try to spread that around and, mm -hmm. and try to keep doing it. We have to foster innovation and creativity, which, you know, speaks to, you know, uh, uh, looking for, you know, solutions that are sort of outside of uh, what we are normal, you know, thinking about sure. and responding to public health issues. But, um, and then, you know, it has to support benefits for all. So all right. I think talking about that and those public health values is sort of the perfect segue to ask about what work has already been done. I mean, you mentioned building on what exists and coming up with creative and innovative ideas. So let's talk about some of the work that's been done and resources that are already available. Okay. Well, you know, I think what's, uh, what's uh, really important is that there have been a number of, you know, sort of task force and, and uh, put together and work groups, and they've come up with a number of different plans that are specific to New York State, and I think we should all be familiar with these. And within those are recommendations for adaptation, recommendations for addressing public health outcomes, uh, and I um, uh, and, you know, that's a place to build on. It also demonstrates the amount of support we have for the work that we're going forward. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that one of the things that is really important to highlight with all of this is that New York State and local health departments are not alone in these efforts. We had an opportunity to talk with Jan Storm from the New York State Department of Health about some of those collaborative efforts that are taking place and their successes. Let's hear what Jan has to say. My name is uh, Jan Storm and I work in the uh, Bureau of Toxic Substance Assessment in the Center for Environmental Health. Our job is to basically protect public health. And so the way we want to do that in the face of unavoidable climate change is to develop and implement adaptations. Sometimes they're called interventions. And there's basically two different kinds of adaptations or interventions. Um, we could have general interventions or adaptations or specific interventions. And the, um, an example of a general intervention is just um, developing and implementing outreach and education information that clearly explains the link between climate and climate change and health outcomes. And that's important to do because the more public and private stakeholders know about climate health, climate and health, um, the more likely they are to, to engage in activities that will help us mitigate and reduce the, the impact of climate change on public health. There's a number of state and local partnerships, but two examples of those, program, of those state and local partnerships are the uh, New York State Climate Smart Communities Program and the NYSERDA Cleaner Greener Communities Program, which I'll talk about in just a minute. 
The New York State Climate Smart Communities Program is a collaboration or a partnership between six different state agencies and local communities. And in this case, the local communities are towns, villages, counties across New York State. The Climate Smart Community Partnership uh, has a lot of different components to it. A very important component is to help the climate smart communities reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases. At the same time, it wants to help communities build resiliency or sustainability into their communities by modifying their transportation systems, by um, better controlling uh, surface water flow to control flooding, um, while at the same time maybe building in economic incentives. So the um, Cleaner Greener Communities Program is really a program which is initiated by NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, and it was really designed as in, in two phases. In the first phase, NYSERDA provided about $10 million to overall to the 10 regional economic councils, council regions that the governor established in 2011. And the money was to be used to develop sustainability plans for those regions. And the sustainability plan um, you know, needed to be consistent with the strategic economic plans which had already been developed for those regional economic council areas. And phase two is now underway. And phase two, um, NYSERDA is providing up to $90 million, again, competitively across the uh, Regional Economic Council regions to actually implement projects that were laid out in those sustainability plans. The way that connects to the Climate Smart Community Program is that NYSERDA is working very closely with the Climate Smart Community Program and in evaluating those applications, if the project is going to occur in a Climate Smart Community, then that applicant gets extra points. So that's another benefit of, of you know, being a Climate Smart Community um, and it also shows how the programs are working together. Our interaction is, so the Department of Health also works very closely with both the Climate Smart Community Program and the Cleaner Greener uh, Community Program through our participation on a Climate Smart Community Advisory Group, which has representatives from DOH as well as NYSERDA, Department of State, and all these other agencies that have an interest in building resilient communities. We also participate on an interagency adaptation work group which again has representation from all of these other agencies and through that we bring a health perspective into deliberations so we try to make sure that you know uh, specific items in the Climate Smart Community Pledge at least some of them reflect adaptations that will protect public health. I, th I think it's great that there's <clears throat> so many different organizations and communities that are involved in trying to do the work so it's not just the local health department so there's some some models that can be followed um, that are already in existence now is there guidance is there anything in the health uh, the uh, prevention agenda regarding climate change yeah there is Rachel and actually the prevention agenda is sort of like our blueprint for sure. local you know and and state you know public health actions to um, uh, address, you know, to address uh, climate change, there are, you know, several um, areas of the of the prevention agenda where the relevant, you know, environmental health issues are mentioned. So there's water quality, there's air quality, but, you know, most important is under built environment, there's mm -hmm. actually a goal that, that includes climate change. So you actually have to address, you know, it actually says, uh, uh, specifically, you know, sustainability and adaptation to climate change. So improving design and maintenance of the built environment. So, um, you know, what's important here is like we refer back to Jan's, you know, talk is that um, if we can develop, you know, design communities uh, in, a, in a way that makes them resilient uh, to the impacts of, of climate and change, if we have sort of the co-benefits of making communities more, you know, um, a, um, uh, amenable to a sort of active community and active lifestyles and healthier lifestyles in general, but we could also have an impact on, on the, um, their response to some of these extreme weather events as well as the climate change in general. 
So let's talk a little bit about surveillance. And you mentioned earlier that all of this is work that we're already doing. So yeah. surveillance is certainly something the Department of Health and local health departments have been actively doing. What role does surveillance play in? You know, surveillance is extremely core function. I think mm -hmm. it's really important that we all understand um, surveillance, but also surveillance needs here. So just as a general framework. So surveillance informs interventions. And when we look at, you know, sort of climate change, you know, so are we doing, you know, the surveillance that's necessary to understand, you know, who's most at risk and and uh, where the, the most risk uh, individuals are and uh, what interventions um, are likely to be effective. You know, so, so surveillance at a core and then you use that information to then inform you know, the public health interventions and then from there you evaluate those public health interventions and feed back into your surveillance. So it's, it's, an, it's uh, some, of, some of the surveillance, and I'll talk about this different kinds of surveillance, are going to be, you know, sort of one time, let's take a look at what, um, uh, in, uh, let's uncover, you know, what information we need to know in order to design those interventions. Others are sort of ongoing intervention to see how uh, well things, or sort of ongoing surveillance to see how well things are doing. So what yeah. about syndromic surveillance? Can you talk about that? Sure. So, you know, I'm going to here, you know, refer to some sort of specific uh, New York City sort of specific issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from New York City. I'm recently, you know, transplant here to the state health department. Well, so well. I apologize <laughs> if this is like kind of New York City centric, but it's what, what I'm most familiar with. So in New York City, they have a syndromic surveillance system set up for extreme heat events. And during that time, they're monitoring um, uh, emergency department visits and EMS calls, and uh, when you take a look at the the chart that's um, uh, that they put out with the syndromic surveillance, you'll see that you know the heat index and emergency medical service um, uh, calls, the model for that, you know those emergency medical calls, they follow each other pretty well. So when it gets hot, more people start suffering from heat-related illness, and it's kind of like what we expect, mm -hmm. you know, for that particular temperature. Right. But um, it demonstrates sort of during the emergency response for that extreme heat event, the, the need uh, to, uh, in, to continue with uh, the interventions such as you know, opening of cooling centers, checking on the vulnerables, uh, uh, ensuring that um, uh, people are using, get the correct messages out there to ensure people are using those interventions that are most important. And are, is there syndromic surveillance related to hypothermia and cold issues That's as right. well? That's right. We're talking a lot about heat and floods today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think this tells an interesting story. So um, hypothermia, you know, although we expect, like, the winters to get a little bit warmer and not to have as many, you know, as much snowfall in New York State, one of the things that's important is that, you know, we may be seeing uh, more severe winter storms. So uh, back when, you know, when I was at the city, we had a, a fellow there who um, took on an, an interesting project to take a look at, you know, whether you can design a similar system for syndromic surveillance for hypothermia, so for cold-related illness, mm -hmm. that you have for um, hyperthermia. And she demonstrated that the model, you know, for their syndromic surveillance matched pretty well with like hospital discharge data. And that's really great to know. And what happened was is that after Sandy, they were able to implement this syndromic, because they had this model already developed, they were able to implement this syndromic surveillance uh, right after Hurricane Sandy, which was an unusual event because it was a sort of a late, you know, season hurricane that was then followed by, you know, sort of extreme cold. So that's sort of an example of, of a current example of how this syndromic surveillance is being used to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. Would That's you right, say? because it was able to inform, you know, sort of a response, get out messaging out there that look, you know, there are hypo, you know, there, there's an increase in hypothermia. People, you know, um, uh, were impacted by the storm, and then now they're being impacted by the cold that follows. Now, what about data regarding heat illness that could be used to inform interventions? Right. So, so here's another look at surveillance. This is sort of like a retrospective kind of look at you know what has happened during extreme heat events in in the past. So, um, so if you, if you look at this chart, sort of on the on the far left, what we have are um, uh, emergency department visits for heat related illness. And if you take a look, where were people exposed? You know, they were exposed. You know outside of their home, in other places. So are we seeing, are these the workers? Are these athletes? Are these people out on, uh, on the street who are being exposed to heat and then getting sick? Uh, and so the interventions for them are very different than if we look at the right side of this, which are the people who died. Uh, during from heat stroke during um, extreme weather you know extreme heat events mm -hmm. and and these are people who are mostly exposed in their home and those are those are different individuals those are people who have underlying you know risk factors either being an older age or, or having um, uh, uh, underlying chronic diseases um, that put them at risk for dying and so the interventions are very different 
So certainly the, the heat and heat-related illness is a problem. Now, can you talk about an example of where surveillance data has been used to change policy? Right. So here's another New York City example. Sure. Right? So, um, so uh, uh, folks at the New York, epidemiologists at the New York City Department of Health took a look at retrospective um, excess mortality mm -hmm. uh, and how that's associated with, um, with, with temperature and heat index, particularly the heat index. Heat index is a measure of apparent temperature that's a combination of temperature and humidity. And that actually has a bigger impact on health outcomes than just temperature alone. So, um, so they took a look at that, and the National Weather Service at that time was issuing advisories um, at a threshold where, you know, that was equivalent to, um, uh, uh, it was higher, but equivalent to the health outcomes you see at a lower threshold. So initially it was a heat index greater than or equal to 100 for one day. Um, it turns out that had the same sort of health impact as having a heat index for, uh, uh, of 95 or greater. Uh, for two days. And because of that, the National Weather Service changed their threshold for issuing an advisory. They lowered it specifically for New York City based on local health outcome data. And, um, and, and that also triggered a change in the, uh, in the city's emergency heat response. Now, do we have, you know, do we need to do that for other locations? Do we see that same relationship in other places? And that's what, you know, surveillance data can tell us. Well, I think that's, you know, you've apologized for it being New York City examples, but I think it's a great example, so it's relevant for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, are there resources available where people can find more information about some of these effects of extreme weather? That's right. I mean, here at the State Health Department, we have a lot of educational materials available, mm -hmm. and I think what's, what's important about the educational material is that it contains sort of actionable items, uh, things that people can do to protect themselves, to be safe and healthy, you know, during exposure to weather conditions. Um, and, and, you know, I, what's, what's important is we have this information, and I, I think we always have to, you know, figure out, is it, is it um, uh, uh, geared towards the populations in sort of the local uh, areas, you know, we have to take a look at lo one, one responsibility of sort of local public health professionals is to say, you know, is this information, you know, reaching them? Are they absorbing it? And is it getting them to understand that, that those vulnerable populations, is it getting them to understand that they're the ones at risk for sure. adverse health outcomes? Now, certainly mm -hmm. there's been a lot of resources developed, research done. What areas would you say we still need to do more research on? Right. So there's a lot we still need to know. There's always a lot we still need to know. I think we have enough mm -hmm. to begin, you know, uh, uh, to continue our work on, on developing effective interventions. But I think there's a lot still that we should, we should know more about. And one is, you know, sort of the relationships uh, between, you know, climate and weather factors and health and understanding, you know, sort of more to the subtleties of those relationships. That's really important for us to know, uh, to understand more about risk factors as well as understand um, about what we, we should expect to see in the future and understand who we should be reaching. Uh, and then um, uh, who are those that are most at risk? So getting those risk factors sort of identified. And then, of course, evaluating our interventions to see that they're uh, effective. Now, what about on the education and, and surveillance efforts? What areas would you say we need more effort there? Right. So, so we already have a lot of effort. So I don't want to, you know, dis dismiss. I think, you know, one thing that's very important that everybody understands is that we're already doing a lot of this work. Sure. We're not in unfamiliar territory. We're talking about familiar things. Surveillance is familiar to us. And so um, what may be important is sort of locally um, uh, uh, targeted surveillance and epidemiology to understand, you know, these risk factors in, in different areas. Uh, and then in terms of sort of outreach and education, you know, once again, I'm going to mention this again, is that are those messages, you know, penetrating the right populations? Are, are the people who are most at risk um, self-identifying? Are the people who come in contact with them, the stakeholders, are they identifying that they're in touch with those people who are at risk and so that they can act appropriately to, um, to help them um, uh, adapt to, you know, a changing climate? So there's always going to be yeah. a list of we need to do more research here, we need to do more outreach here, but there's good news on this on this information as well, right? That's right. I think one you know what's really important to understand and I and I started off my talk with this is that you know is that there is already acceptance, you know that we've 
you know, reached that point where, you know, the weather has uh, changed and the climate is changing over, uh, and we have, you know, retrospective data to show that, and we have projections that are, you know, fairly good to demonstrate that it's going to continue going forward. Um, and I think uh, uh, we have uh, general acceptance that, you know, there are, there, are, there are public health outcomes associated with those uh, the changes in climate um, in a lot of different areas. And the good news is, is that the research is following it. So if you take a look at, you know, what, what you get on a PubMed search for uh, weather, climate, and health, you know, that number has been increasing rapidly in recent years. Excellent. Now, I know some examples of leading research on climate change and health is being done right here in New York State. We met with Xiao Lin to hear about some of the cutting edge work that she has conducted on this topic, and we'll have an opportunity now to hear what she has to say. So my name is Xiao Lin, and I'm the session chief for epidemiology study and evaluation in the Center for Environmental Health, and also I'm the research director for our Bureau, Bureau for Occupational and Environmental Epidemiology. So currently, as a principal investigator, I'm leading three uh, projects granted by the federal government. The first one is uh, funding by CDC, so which is looking at uh, climate change and variability. The second project uh, is funded by MIH, uh, it's looking at um, climate change and vulnerability in pregnant women. The third project um, is funded by NYSHODA, it just started this year, it's uh, look at the population vulnerability to climate change in New York State and planning the uh, different adaptation strategy. So we, we do look at some of the um, biological possible but understudy health outcomes such as renal disease, birth defect, and also the waterborne and foodborne disease. So uh, those are Lyme disease too. So this kind of four uh, type of disease is like very rare study by previous uh, studies. So also it's not common in the literature. The first thing is we do find, um, we found the renal disease um, is related to the extreme heat. Also we, very interesting, we do find the um, different type of renal disease is have different patterns, like different climate factor and response patterns. So the, re, uh, the concept behind that is like because uh, human do not uh, respond to weather factor individually. So instead they respond to the whole climate system, so which will be represented a more realistic representation of the climate exposure. So for this reason, that's why we look at the whole multiple um, weather factors simultaneously. So um, I think the first thing we do find the, uh, the geographic variation for the climate factor and health response relationship, so which implies probably the adaptation strategies should be different by different area because the heat threshold is different by different area and also uh, the local community uh, characteristics and local climate is different. We try to, um, based on our data we use and we try to establish um, we call the climate and health sharing system by incorporating the, our health data and climate data into the ongoing environmental public health tracking system. Yeah, we also create a, we call the research corner in the environmental public health um, tracking system by putting all our published papers, like by using the maps and charts or some of the, um, the figures, the public easy to accept or more visible in the, uh, the research corner to let uh, to put in the we call the public portal for environmental public health tracking system. We are not just work by ourselves. We also uh, sit in the multiple uh, national climate group. They call it national climate work group. So um, we help them to create some like the uh, climate indicator. So we also share our share with our finding with other states. Or, or of course we learn uh, from other states too. So by working with the national level and also other states, uh, we also try to uh, write some like the. Um, white paper for the uh, U.S. Congress regarding the climate change and health. So we think uh, by using this way, we can just uh, learn from each other yeah, to, um, to also Im improve our skill in the climate health research. So certainly a lot of great, great work being done, great research. Now, as we work to prepare for future climate impacts on health, what are some of the priority areas you think we should be focusing on? Right. Well, you know, I think we have to think about how we select priorities in um, in public health. Uh, you know, we, we should, of course, be focusing on the things that are having the greatest sort of impact now or potential for impact on public health now. 
-hmm. you know, so let's 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 take a look at those. I mean, in New York State, we know that it's getting hotter. Uh, we know that um, uh, uh, we've seen increase in precipitation, and there's also related to that the extreme weather events that have been associated, such as the the heat wave that we're currently experiencing, the floods that we we saw, you know, pretty recently and over the last couple of years, and in, in um, and then also the increase that's associated with extreme heat events like air pollution and uh, and bad you know poor poor air quality days uh, and then um, of course you know also with those events you know power outages and those health risks associated with power outages as well as the spread of you know vector borne disease and I can keep listing them yeah. right because you know they've sort of like you know it's sort of a very you know complete list because a lot of things are, are changing with the right. changing climate in terms of public health concerns but the the ones um, uh, that I mentioned above, you know, they feed directly back into, like, what should we be focusing on in terms of surveillance, you know, and I spoke a lot about surveillance mm -hmm. because I think it's really important that we have good data sure. that demonstrates what the health risks are and how that is going to inform those interventions, and those interventions, some of them fall to uh, emergency preparedness and response those extreme weather events. Others fall, you know, to sort of local health department responses and our collaborations with uh, stakeholders, which um, uh, is extremely important. So we have these partnerships and collaborations that help us to uh, um, uh, not only penetrate into the communities that we think are going to be most impacted, but also broaden our ability to uh, um, adapt to climate change because of the effectiveness of interventions get, um, you know, sort of institutionalized and sure. part of communities and part of our, our daily life. And and then, of course, we have to take a look at those uh, uh, those interventions. Um, we have to evaluate to make sure that those value, you know, that those interventions are being effective. And I think, um, uh, you know, sort of going, you know, sort of going forward. Um, uh, uh, I think we have, of course, a lot of work to do, sure. but I think we're doing a lot of that work already. Absolutely, and I think know? you've talked about yeah. great examples of work so. that's being done. And mm -hmm. one of the questions that we have actually from the audience is, are there online resources that a citizen might be able to access about climate change or responses to severe weather issues? Right. So, so I think that's a great question because uh, you know there's a lot of stuff online. Like anybody who Google's anything is going to get a million results, right? So, so if you take take a look at our website, the New York State Department of Health website, we have a, a tremendous amount of information, both you know education and outreach information. But then you know Xiao mentioned in her talk um, the information that's available on the Environmental Public Health Tracking Portal, which um, uh, has uh, uh, indicators for climate change uh, that's available to the public, and anybody can work with it. And then Jan talked about uh, the, the um, uh, uh, different programs that are, you know, headed up by Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, uh, you know, Climate Smart Communities, and that has information on online that's available for the public. Uh, and of course, the um, uh, emergency uh, management uh, agencies, both at the state, local level, have information uh, on preparing and, and, and responding to uh, climate-related and extreme weather events. Great. So I think there's a lot of information out there. It's, you know, and I, I, I highly recommend that, you know, people review it. Take a look. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question, and uh, a great question. What are the different adaptation strategies for rural versus urban areas? Now, that's a big question to answer. That's we right. only have about a minute left, but <laughs> if you could just address yeah. it briefly, so, even. Yeah, so so I think you know there there are big differences. I did talk a lot about urban you know areas because that's where I was most familiar with. But you know there are some major differences. Like if we think about cooling centers in an urban environment, there are you know a lot of resources you know for um, for people to get to those cooling centers during heat waves because they're a short walk or they can take public transportation. But when you're in a rural area, you know that you know is going to be is going to be different um, accessibility to sure. cooling centers. And I think that's one area of research going forward is understanding that and showers you know um, may have mentioned that during her talk that you know it's an area uh, looking forward um, going forward uh, so um, you know, it's a different adaptation strategy uh, and um, you know one thing that's sort of common and I think you know like I think there are sort of common principles across the board you know one thing we always have to think about when it comes to uh, uh, most events but also sort of the general change people like to stay at home mm -hmm. you know I think that I concept of sort of sheltering in place uh, versus going to you know evacuation centers I think we have to understand why people you know choose not to go to evacuation centers why they choose to shelter mm -hmm. in place um, you know and and uh, and then what the health risks are associated with with sheltering in place and how to make that you know sort of uh, a, a safer, safer choice you know sort of a risk reduction you know uh, in those in those scenarios sure. um, where, where people do choose to shelter in place well, Nathan, yeah. that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much for all of the information you've shared with us today. I think this has been a really informative talk for our viewers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs and continuing education credits are available. To obtain nurse continu continuing education hours, CME and CHES credits, learners must visit www.phlive.org and complete an evaluation and the post-test for today's offering. Additional information on upcoming broadcasts and relevant public health topics can also be found on our Facebook page. Don't forget to like us on Facebook to stay up to date. As a reminder, you can also download the companion guide to this, website, to this broadcast on our website, phlive.org. The companion guide will provide you with learning activities to help further your knowledge and understanding of the topics covered in today's program. This webcast will be available on demand on our website within two weeks, and DVDs of any of our Public Health Live broadcasts can be ordered from our website as well. Please join us for our next broadcast on August 15th as we discuss Teens and Taboo, a look at prevalence and prevention of sexually transmitted infections. I'm Rachel Breidster. Thanks for joining us on Public Health Live.